Uh, last week, we studied the vine and the branches, first part of John 15. Uh, the vine being Jesus, the branches being us, and the gardener being the Father. We talked a lot about the heart of the Father, that his ministry, if you will, to us. We usually think of it going the other way, but his ministry to us, his focus to us is to lift us up and to cleanse us with the word of God so that we will bear fruit and bear fruit abundantly. And over and over, we are told to abide, to cling to the vine, to stay, to make our home with Jesus. Without that, we cannot bear fruit. That is love, joy, and peace. It's just, it's not in our lives without that clinging to Jesus. And if we're abiding, the Father wants to give us whatever we ask. He's on the edge of his seat. He's waiting to bless our lives, waiting for us to trust him so that he can bless us. Remember, he is a yes God. We looked at that extensively last week, and we spent a lot of time unpacking that. Verse 7 If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. And it was, it's interesting. It's, it's a, it's a difficult verse. We talked about that. It's challenging because, because we can't quite do the math. Um, and I had some, I had some questions, you know, like the most common question after that last week was, well, what do you do with the unanswered prayer? You know, so, so long that for me, it's just, you just throw it on kind of in the corner. You just say, well, it's not as well. I guess it's just not as well. And that, that, that's just, I'm, I'm kind of done doing that. I think that's too easy. I think I'm missing something with that. That's a way really for me to protect my own sense of disappointment. And I think it short circuits the process, the process we were talking about last week of abiding. I mean, of course, an unanswered prayer is not his will because he makes stars and he asks us to ask. So if he didn't make a star this week when I asked him for it, Apparently, it wasn't his will to do that, at least for now. Inadvertently, when I just throw his God's will, God's will, I just throw it out, it it can potentially blaming him, Um, potentially saying he isn't a yes God. So I can't just leave it there. Yeah, I can't can't leave it at that. And uh, in fact, that's what the passage was about. The passage actually gives us a solution of what to do with answered prayer. It says, abide. Just like other places in the New Testament, it says, ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking. Seek and keep seeking. The bottom line is if I don't keep asking, I know I'm missing out. I'm missing out on discovering what's really going on in my heart. Discovering some kind of deeper faith. You know, you can look online. What's the reason for unanswered prayer? And there's all kinds of websites that just analyze. You know, one of them said there's 20 reasons for unanswered prayer. I was like, okay, I got to like number five. It was like, oh, this is just too much. Actually, the passage here tells us what to do. As I said, abide. It's really quite simple. Just keep asking, stay in it. And because if you don't, you're going to miss something about yourself, and you may miss the miraculous. I have a sales friend who, you know, sales, salespeople are great. They're, I think they're the bravest people in, in life because they go into places that don't want whatever they're selling, and they somehow have to convince them to get what they're selling, right? Really, it takes bravery. I had this sales friend of mine. He said, look, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Pretty good line, isn't it? If you don't ask, it's always no. So we're called to ask and keep asking and stay in the abiding. You know, I have an example in my own life, unanswered prayer, and I don't think it's that different than anybody here. You know, when that, that lottery gets to a billion dollars, <laughs> come on. Everybody buys a ticket, right? And I don't care the statistics. It's a gazillion to trillion billion to one, right? I don't care. God makes stars could be that one ticket. And come on, you got to be honest now. You know when you get the ticket, you pray. (laughs) You ask. And to date, all of my prayers have been unanswered. But if I take this passage seriously, and I have on occasion to simply really go into the presence of God and ask him why. I mean, I give a lot of it away, God. (laughs) 
Here's what I find, here's what I found with that particular one, just as an example. The Lord asked me one time, he goes, well, what do you want it for? And, and the problem with the biting is you actually have to be really honest because the God of the universe is talking to you. He's the counselor. He's actually listening to what's in your heart, even when you're not aware of it. So to that question, my answer is, well, I want it because I really don't want to trust you for my daily sustenance. I really would rather have it in the bank. That, that's, that sounds more comfortable for me. So if I don't abide and I don't keep asking, I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss this subtle mistrust to him. I'm going to miss the subtle, yeah, I know you make stars, but I'm not sure you're that interested in me. That comes out of me a lot. I I have issues that way. So we're to abide, keep asking, stay in. It reveals something in our own hearts. Sometimes it reveals our motives. Sometimes it reveals a mistrust of a miraculous God. And I don't want my heart to get away with that anymore. I think, I think I've been missing. I think I've been missing out on bigger things. I think I've been missing some of the things in my own heart for all those reasons. So, let's move on. We're gonna continue to talk about abiding this morning. In verse nine, we pick it up. Even as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you obey my commands, you will abide in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and abide in his love. Okay, we're introducing a new concept to abiding. It's obedience. Do what he says and you'll abide, right? Well, it's interesting. The New Testament has two different words for obedience. And and they're all, in English, they're appropriately translated obey. You know, it's one of those things you look at the Greek. What does obey mean? Oh, it means obey. Oh, okay. But, but there's some wrinkles to it. You know, Greek is a much more, um, it's a much more specific language. English is just kind of, you know, here, here's obey, here's love, and there's all kinds of different kinds of love. There's different kinds of obedience that we're going to look at today. There's one word in Greek, it's hupakuo. Hupa means to come under something. And it, it really just means to, to hear it and do it. That's hupakuo. And you're just supposed to hear it, do it, don't ask questions, don't argue, who cares if you like it or not? Unfortunately, a lot of Christians obey in this way. Uh, they just want to hear what God says and just, just go do it. No discussion, no argument, no need to understand. In the New Testament, this word is used almost exclusively of slaves and children. And it is almost never, there's one exception, but it's almost never used of an adult Christian. It is not the word for obey here. It's almost never used for adult believers. The word that is used here and used for an adult believer throughout the New Testament is very different. It's the word tereo. And that Greek word means to guard protectively, to watch over, maybe even to cherish, to value in such a way that you cherish or guard it. Rhonda and I, several years ago, went to London and you go to the, when you go to London, you have to go to the Tower of London. It's a, it's a fortress that reaches back to a 1,000 years. And they store the crown jewels of the British kingdom there. And you get to see them. But you walk into this room, and there's just armed guards everywhere and bulletproof glass. And they don't even let you pause and look at the stuff. You actually, you're on like a conveyor belt, like this flat escalator just moves by. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> They don't even want you to linger. They are guarding protectively. They are taking the crown jewels and they're watching over it. They cherish those jewels. They guard them protectively. This is the concept of obedience in this passage. If as a believer, that this means that if as a believer, I reduce my faith down to just hearing and doing it, I've actually completely missed obedience. This says if I obey God's rules without cherishing them without loving them, I'm actually disobeying. I have not obeyed at all. According to this, some of us may be doing exactly what the rules say, but still be disobedient. If I simply hear and do whatever God requires, I am disobeying in the middle of my presumed obedience. It's a very different word. We've all met Christians like this, right? They reduce the faith to rules 
And the quintessential example is that old Saturday Night Live skit of church lady, right? She's the epitome of this. Just here's the rules, and I'm gonna watch you to make sure you do them. Isn't that special? I heard an interview by Dana Carvey. He said that was a composite of women in the church that he had to go to as a little kid. We've seen them. These are disobedient. And actually, Jesus in his day, he had this problem. He had believers who were obeying in this way. That's kind of what the Pharisees were doing. That's the people he yelled at the most. He was so frustrated with them. And there's a verse that Paul quotes in Romans 2. It says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You're the ones who are supposed to be carrying the light of God. And the world hates God because they look at you. And they look at you, you just obey, you just do these rules, and that's the extent of God. <sighs> Nobody wants a part of that. If they didn't want a part of that 2,000 years ago, they don't want a part of that this, in, in this day. I grew up Catholic, and we used to have a joke about Baptists. Why do Baptists, why are they against premarital sex? It might lead to dancing. A rule-based life tends to make a distorted faith, and it distorts the truth. That kind of faith, if you will, makes us all look bad. The word, the word tereo, is, 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 it requires relationship. It is not simply hearing and doing. It actually drives us back to abiding. Imagine this story. A husband brings home to his wife flowers every day for a week, and you know, this is unusual. She's touched by this. And she, she responds with the thank you and, and joy. And, and he says, well, it, it's just my duty. It's my obligation. What's love got to do with it? That's not it. No, we obey not because we have to, but because we love Jesus. We highly value his principles. And be, because we know he loves us, his principles are keeping us safe and giving us that abundant life. So, what does it mean then when I don't want to obey? When I don't feel like doing what God wants me to do? I read a book a while ago called Knowing God by this guy named Blackaby. He, had, he said it the best way. He goes, Christians never have an obedience problem. We only have a love problem. This, this command of obedience is, requires love. It requires us to go back and abide, to reconnect with God. And so when I'm wanting to be disobedient or I sin, the answer is to reconnect with God. That's actually the opposite thing I wanna do when I'm doing something wrong or I have done. There's too much shame and guilt. But shame and guilt, it leads to more sin. Jesus wants to free us from this. He wants to free us from this cycle. The answer is always come back to him and reconnect so that the Father can lift us up and cleanse us with the truth of his word. Verse 11, Jesus goes on, he says, I've told you this so that you, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the goal. The goal is fruit, which includes joy. Complete joy, by the way, the word complete means filled to the brim and you couldn't even add another molecule without it going over the brim. That's what the word means. Biblical obedience forces me back to abiding. It forces me back to the source of love, to remember how loved I am by God. And, and, and with that comes a reaction in my heart where I want to. I want to guard protectively. I want to cherish what he would like me to do. Look at this verse, Romans 12:1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. The word urge you means to come alongside you and encourage you, to call near, to invite you into something. It's, it's parakaleo, and we also, uh, the Greek word paraklete is the word for Holy Spirit. It's what he does. He comes alongside and he encourages us. So we're, we're being encouraged by the Holy Spirit, by the mercies of God. That's the word for tender, loving kindness. It's, it's not just love. It's a kindness with love. It's an understanding of who we are and what we go through. 
And of course, that's the character of the gardener, the father. He understands us. That's why he's there to lift us up and to cleanse off the dirt and dust of our, of our existence on this planet. It's his love, his kindness. So we are, we are urged, we are invited to remember that loving kindness and then to present our bodies, which is, this is referring to the sacrificial system of the Jews. What, is the, what does the sacrifice do? What does the animal do? He gives his all. So that is, that's our encouragement. That's what this is saying. In light of God's incredible love and kindness and tenderness and mercy and compassion, we are encouraged to give it all. And that is called our spiritual service. Now, Jeremy unlocked that a few months ago. The word spiritual actually means reasonable, logical. It means that it's only reasonable. It points back to these tender kindnesses of God in light of the amazing heart of God that caused him to give the ultimate sacrifice of his son. In light of this, it's only reasonable to respond by yielding to him, presenting our bodies to do whatever he asks us to do. This fits perfectly with the word obey in this passage, to cherish what God wants to do. It's only reasonable. It's, it's an emotional response. It, it's something that you end up wanting, they didn't want to do before you were abiding, but now you do want to do. Okay, so what does he want us to do? Maybe just be good. Maybe share Christ. Maybe bring people to church. Maybe just don't lie and cheat and steal. That's a good idea. All good things. But Jesus tells us in the next verse what encompasses it all. He says, my command is this in verse 12. Love each other as I have loved you. So here's how the process go. God loves, goes. God loves us. We love God in response. And then that response is to yes. Yes, God. Yes, 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because God loved us first. It's causality. We need that causality in our lives. We need to always remember how much we are loved. This is the only way we can obey commands. This is, this is why abiding is so critical. We cling to Jesus, experience his amazing love for us, and then and only then do we really have the power to love others. It's the only way. He said it, apart from me, you can do nothing. I looked up that Greek word, nothing. It means nothing. <laughs> it's actually worse than nothing. It's like a double nothing. It's nothing, nothing. No, nothing, not at all, not, not nothing. We are incapable without him. So that means no matter what God wants us to do, it must start from abiding. Abiding and receiving, receiving his love, and then we are interested in following what he wants us to do. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do what I command. You know, it's easy to love the lovable. I mean, it's easy to love people who love you. It's, in fact, I don't even need to abide for that. You know, it's easy to be around easy people. Abiding is even unnecessary in a way. But when things are tough in your life, they're challenging, then abiding becomes essential. The challenge is to do the impossible, to lay down his life. That's the way we love, to sacrifice what I want for someone else. Verse 15, I, am no, I no longer call you servants. That means a slave. Because a servant or a slave does not know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. That's what you do with friends. So what do masters not do with slaves? They're not required to love them. Certainly not to lay down their life. And what do slaves not do for their masters? Love them back. You know, I once heard it said, the best example of slavery today is employment. Hopefully that's not your experience if you're an employee. Hopefully none of my employees feel that way. I don't know. <laughs> Better check. But actually, if, it, if the word obey, it fits. If you're an employee, your job is to hear what your boss wants and do it. 
That's why you get paid. You're supposed to hear what he wants and do it. And Jesus is saying, that's not my relationship with you. He's underscoring this actual meaning of the word obey. That's not who we are anymore. And, and, and the Jews previously presumed that's what they were. And they were supposed to look through the law and see how the law was inadequate and hearing and doing the law could never really bring you to God. They were supposed to see it. And, and by the time they, they, Jesus came along, they had done the opposite so badly. They had 600 commands of various things you were, were to do and not do. So such that relationship with God had just kind of become way in the background. And it was only about the rules. He said one time as a metaphor, he says to the Pharisees, he says, you strain a gnat and swallow a camel. They were straining gnats because they couldn't drink anything unclean. So they'd take water and they would strain it out to make sure there's no unclean animal in it. But they'd swallow a camel. They'd miss the heart of the law. And he says, okay, that slave mentality, that's not you and me. Uh-uh, no, that hear and do it, that is not us. You're a friend. And friends care about each other. Friends do things for others, for their friend, that they want to do. It is not like employment. You are not Jesus' employee. Let me give you this example. You're an employee. Your boss asks you to do a bunch of things for the day. You do everything absolutely perfectly. And then you come into his office at the end of the day, and he says, well, you know, there's just one more thing. One thing that would make your day absolutely perfect, and you kind of go, okay, I did everything perfectly. I mean, what could it possibly be? So the boss says, well, now I want you to love me. <laughs> be my friend, companion, stay with me, abide, hang out all the time. What would our response be? Come on, <laughs> you don't pay me enough for that. So that's not the relationship. Jesus said, that, that's, that's, that is not your relationship with me. This is about relationship. This is about love, and obedience flows out of that. In a way, it's the byproduct. Now, it may be the thing that we all see in each other, but it is always to be the byproduct because we are not employees of Jesus. We are not his slaves. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Now, these, these verses 16 and 17 is kind of a recap of everything we've done in the last two weeks. So let me recap what we've talked about as we close. Verse one and 15, we're called to bear fruit. We're the, we're the branch, he is the vine, the Father is the, is the vine dresser. We're to cling to the vine, and there's no other way. We looked at that extensively last week. You can't cut the branch off and expect it to bear fruit. There is no way to bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, all that good stuff in Galatians 5. No way to do that if we're disconnected to him. And in that process that we cling to the vine in this broken planet, we get pushed around. We literally get beaten down by life, and the Father is there to lift us up. And the dirt and dust from the bombardment of the false information we get, just the false lies that we get from this world. You're not enough. You're, you need to do this. You need to be anxious. You know, you, on and on and on. The Father is there to cleanse our minds of the truth, and give us the truth of who he is and how he loves us. And as part of all that, we can ask the Father for whatever we want. It's just, it's easy. We're in relationship because he's a yes God. And then, then this week, we've learned about abiding in obedience, which is really a continuation of the abiding of the clinging to the vine, of the relating to Jesus and getting our hearts to a place where we want what he wants and, and overall, these, I love these 17 verses because they give me something very practical for my own life. They give me two tests. We talked about the first test last week. I can, I can take a moment and look at my own heart and test, especially those three fruits that we talked about in Galatians 5, love, joy, and peace. I can immediately say, okay, is my heart at peace? Am I feeling joy? Am I feeling love? And it, it's a great test, because the answer isn't, oh, I better go do something. No, the answer is, okay, what have I forgotten? What, if I'm not feeling those, what am I missing? 
What am I not connecting to? What am I not believing about the love of God? It's a great test. And the further test we've talked about today is that of obedience. There's sometimes I just frankly don't want to do what he says. I don't want to love that person. Come on. When I don't want to obey, an alarm bell is supposed to go off. Okay, there's something wrong again. I am not filled up. I, 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 I am trying to draw in instead of being an overflow. That's what I'm supposed to be. When I abide, I'm an overflow to my world. And remember, we never have an obedience problem. We only have love problems. This whole passage we've studied in John 15, it's all about being close. It's all about God invading our lives with his love. There's one verse at the end of Psalm 23. It says, uh, surely goodness and loving kindness shall, it says mostly in English, shall follow me. It, it's not acts way stronger than follow. It says, surely loving kindness and, and mercy shall pursue me. God is a pursuing God. He is pursuing me. And it's my abiding is really just turning and saying, okay, I'll let you pursue me. It's all about clinging to him and drawing close to him and literally drawing life from him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your character, for your ministry to us. Thank you for understanding us, for sending your son who says, it says of him that he has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin and that he is a high priest, priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Lord, you get it, you understand it. Your son Jesus actually lived it. And in that understanding, you have loving kindness. You love us and you're kind towards us, Father. Thank you for your ministry in our lives. And Lord, teach us to be hungry for that. Teach us to be hungry enough for love, joy, and peace. Teach us to be hungry enough for the overflow in our lives that is required to love those around us, Lord. Teach us that, in Jesus' name.